They built for Sorab, son of Rostam, a tomb like to a horse's hoof. And Rostam laid him therein in a chamber of gold perfumed with ambergris. And he covered him with brocades of gold, and when it was done, the house of Rostam grew like to a grave, and its courts were filled with the voice of sorrow. And no joy would enter into the heart of Rostam, and it was long before he held high his head. In 53 BCE, Crassus met his end, and the Parthians had secured their victory against multiple Roman legions entering their territories unprovoked. This victory allowed them to secure the lands directly east of the Euphrates. The general Surina from the house of Surin would die under mysterious circumstances. Some say it was murder by Orides owing to his great popularity among the people. Perhaps clues or the start of this rumor lay in the writings of Plutarch. He would describe him a century later as follows. An extremely distinguished man in wealth, birth, and in the honor paid to him. He ranked next after the king. In courage and ability, he was the foremost Parthian of his time, and in stature and personal beauty, he had no equal. He was also said by Plutarch to have dressed in the fashion of the Medes, and his name would millennia later remain a popular male name in present-day Iran. The Parthian military felt the sting of Surina's death, and the next few military campaigns would not go quite as expected. In August of 51, Orides sent an expeditionary cavalry force across the Euphrates and into Syria as a show of force over the Romans. The force was headed by his favorite son, Pacorus, and the Parthian general Ossesis. Cassius was now acting Roman governor of Syria, and he was ready for them near Antioch, ambushing them and killing Ossesis in the process. Rome's loss of men and their standards at Carhe struck the Roman psyche hard. Revenge would not be an immediate response, for in 44, Julius Caesar would be murdered, plunging the supporters of Caesar and those of Pompey into a civil war called the Liberator's Civil War. This would see conflict rage across the Republic and the regions buffering Parthia would be no exception. According to historian Cassius Dio, Brutus and Caesar sent the Roman general Labinus who'd supported Pompey to Orides. Another source, Festus, says he fled. Either way, we know he met with Orides, and it is said that his view of Antony's rule of the eastern provinces was tainted, and that he persuaded Orides to attack the Romans while Antony was occupied in Egypt, stating that the Parthians would, as a result of the misrule, view the Parthians as liberators. Orides agreed, and he provided Labinus with troops and his son Pacorus as having leadership, although some accounts say it was a joint leadership. In 40, they left Parthia and separated each with an objective. Labinus invaded Phoenicia and attacked Apamea, but was repulsed without taking the ancient city. In Phoenicia, though, many of the soldiers who had joined Mark Antony had come from having served Cassius and Brutus. The garrisons of those soldiers capitulated to Labinus. He killed the commander Antony had put in place and those troops who remained loyal to Antony as well. This allowed him to go back and capture Apamea, whose townsfolk capitulated immediately. Meanwhile, Pacorus captured most of Syria with the exception of Tyr, which remained loyal to Antony thanks to having been newly garrisoned by Antony's troops that had survived across the territories and fled there. Pacorus, with no fleet, could not follow, and instead moved on to Judea. He deposed Hyrcanus II and installed his nephew, who also happened to be a foe, on the throne. Labinus had moved on to southern Anatolia, and he was able to win over the allegiance of several cities there. However, two of the cities murdered the garrisons that he'd had installed previously. He also oddly took on the title of Parthicus, which translated to conqueror of the Parthians, despite laying siege to his own people and having sided with the very same Parthians. Mark Antony had thus far not done too much, leading far away in Egypt. There is speculation and multiple theories on why he was so slow to act. 
When he did finally act, it was to go to Tyr, but upon hearing of Syria having been lost, he left almost as quick as he came. And he chose not to return and lead troops himself, instead sending his lieutenant, the skilled General Publius Ventidius Bassus, who, like Antony, had also served under Julius Caesar. He immediately left for Anatolia and shocked Labinus with his landing on the shores. Labinus, in response, fled to Cilicia, where Pacorus was to arrange to have Parthian soldiers rendezvous and join his troops. The coming battle would be known as the Battle of the Cilician Gates. They were a guarded structure in a pass through the Taurus Mountains that connected the low plains of Cilicia to the higher Anatolian Plateau via a gorge that ran its entire length. The gorge itself was narrow and the army wishing to use it would clearly need to be the victor. Ventidius was a brilliant strategist. He was fully aware of the Parthian cavalry archers via a fellow general Saxa who had learned the hard way at an encounter with the Parthians the previous year that to be victorious or stand a chance they would need to have the high ground. Therefore, to nullify the Parthian advantage of the cavalry archers, Ventidius placed his legions on the higher terrain of the mountain slopes. He also ensured he had enough ranged troops in the form of archers and slingers to accompany his heavy infantry. The Parthian general Pharnapetes was eager to attack before Labinus's infantry could join him and he sent his cavalry archers up the hill immediately for a first attack. They sent forth a volley of arrows, but the Romans up high on the slopes blocked these with their shields. Due to their height on the slope, their javelins were more effective than they would have been out on an open level plain. This allowed them to reach those first horse archers, and even as they backed down at quite a range. After a few volleys of these javelins, in addition to arrows and slings, Ventidius commanded the infantry down to the hill where they met the enemy head-on. Due to being lightly armored, range combatants, they were not able to withstand the close-quarter combat from the heavily armored Roman legionaries. After considerable losses, there was a rout, and the surviving Parthians began to flee in mass numbers. Labinus attempted to flee as well, but was quickly captured and promptly executed. The rest of the survivors, they fled to the Amina's Pass to hold it and protect the Syrian gates. Ventidius sent one of his officers, a Roman officer by the name of Pompadius Silo, with cavalry to capture the gate. Upon arriving at the gate, the Parthian general Phernapetes attacked the Roman officer and his cavalry, and he was winning and could have possibly secured a victory, but Ventidius, concerned about his officer's chances, brought the rest of the Roman army in and turned the tide towards the Romans. The general Phernapetes was also killed, leaving both commanders and many Parthian troops dead. Pacorus heard of the defeats and made the decision to retreat and take with him all the troops from the region back across the Euphrates. Pacorus desired to again venture into Syria the following year in 38. Ventidius, aware that Pacorus would likely return with fresh troops, sent several men in response to sow disinformation, implying that Pacorus should cross the Euphrates at the usual point. Pacorus not trusting the convenience of all this disinformation being relayed to him, instead chose to cross further downstream, which was exactly what his foe Ventidius was hoping. Pacorus faced no opposition, and in response it's been speculated that he and his men felt the Romans were cowardly for not preventing their crossing, and that they proceeded towards the town of Gindarus in Seresteca with a false sense of bravado. Ventidius like Surana, however, would ensure previous lessons were built upon, and he again arrayed his soldiers on the high ground of the slopes upon which the town sat. Pacorus immediately ordered the attack, and the horse archers charged towards the Romans uphill, and in a repeat of their first encounter, Ventidius ordered the counterattack first with ranged weapons, and then with his heavy 
infantry which he sent thundering down the hill. They crashed into the wall of the Parthian archer cavalry, who were again not suited to close quarter combat, particularly not on a slope where they had to also balance upon their horses. As wave after wave of horse archers charged up the hill, the outcome was consistently the same. It got so congested that when the will of the frontline horse archers broke, they fled downhill, crashing into their own comrades. The rout was on. Ventidius next ordered the slingers and archers to rain volleys towards the Parthian heavy cavalry that was stationed at the foot of the slopes. He then ordered in his heavy infantry, and they quickly surrounded the cavalry below. The fighting raged, and Pacorus must have tried to grasp how the situation had turned so quickly. He had not been present at the first encounter, and his general and the Roman rebel had both died. Yet here was history repeating itself. He was said to have fought bravely, but was soon identified when but few Parthians were left, and the Roman barrage was halted. The identification was said to come via the fancier armor that he was wearing, and he, along with his bodyguards, were slain. Some of the Parthian cavalry was able to flee, but Ventidius anticipated this also. He guessed correctly that they would attempt to flee the way they had come across the Euphrates. He had sent cavalry earlier to wait and engage any army that attempted to recross the Euphrates. Orides received word that his son had died and was said to have descended into heartbroken grief at the loss. Speculation is that Phrahades IV then murdered Orides and the rest of his half-brothers from his father's first marriage as they held the stronger maternal claim. Phrahades IV would then go on to rule for 35 years, but Parthia's fate was for now still inexplicably woven with that of Rome's and will be covered in the next episode, part seven. I want to thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please hit that like button, share the video with others that also enjoy history. And of course, if you haven't yet, subscribe. Love to have you on board your history. Till the next video, and as always, cheers.